when I was in the creative field, I was hanging around with a lot of creative folks and I, I noticed the business acumen was, was lacking and sometimes the people skills. And there's people in the creative world that just focus on the features, the type of camera, the type of lens, and they, they kind of miss the aspect of the storytelling piece. What are you trying to say? How are we trying to say? How do you want people to feel when they watch this? This is very wise advice for creatives, particularly in the era of AI. <laughs> AI will not replace you, but you need to be able to do more than just produce now, I think. Well, you also know this too. In the beginning, when there's only a few people, the titles don't matter. You know, like CMO, what, like you're doing everything. I'm in the trenches, free C level executives on the team. We answer customer emails for like over a year. You know, and sometimes like 80 a day. We're back with another episode of e-commerce live. We're here with Dean over at heart and soil. I'm one of your hosts, Colin. I'm the director of marketing at live recover. Also have the other host, Corey, who is the CEO of live recover. But today we got Dean. You guys are absolutely crushing it, and this is not an understatement whatsoever. You are absolutely on a tear the past couple of years, and it just seems like you guys are scaling nonstop and doing incredible things. I'm really excited to dive into some questions with you. You come from the background of higher education and content, so you weren't really like in this world before, and then you just plop yourself into it and are now crazy successful, so we'll talk more about that as well. But Corey, you want to take it away? Yeah, thank you, Colin and Dean. We're super excited to have you on. And, you know, as we always do, we'd love to start with just hearing a little bit about your story and your journey. What's not on your resume? How did you come to be where you are? Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me too. Known Colin for, for a little while now, and we've always had some really good conversations around e-com and, and whatnot. So I had zero experience in, in e-com when I, when I got into all this and my journey to CEO is very unconventional. I don't believe you'd probably find a lot of people that, that kind of took this path. I was in previous, but my entire career has really been in content creation and, you know, I was a filmmaker, I was a producer. I did everything from big live events to documentary filmmaking, uh, live studio production, and really played every role from the producer aspects, working with clients, you know, managing budgets, that kind of thing, to managing a team of about 12, you know, graphic design, motion graphics, all that kind of stuff. And I think I mentioned documentary filmmaking. That was like a, a passion of mine that I did on the side. I love learning and it, it might've been why I ended up in higher education. Cause what I thought was really cool about that job is when I first started, like young in my career after I was first hired, I got to watch like thousand business lectures with the McCoy College of Business at Texas State. So they'd have business leaders in and I would sit there, just absorb the information. And then I'd go and I'd research stuff that I was learning. <laughs> That's an interesting way to go to business school <laughs> behind the camera. <laughs> I know. I pretty much got a degree just through osmosis there. It's funny, both Colin and I were or became content producers when we started our brands. I basically became a fashion photographer when I started Distilled. And that was like part of how I got it out there was I established myself as a photographer that all the agencies would send models to. And then I put them in my product and send them home with jeans and they'd post about it. And they'd, that was like a lot of our early growth. So, I mean, I, I see content as so core to not only like building that brand, but also like your growth strategy, right? So it's, it's for sure. A lot of what I was into is I was handling the, the marketing side and the brand side and content more or less. My dad was an entrepreneur as well. So I think I, he started a business literally out of our garage. It's like, and it was a, a small business, appliances, appliance repair. So I, I watched him grow that as a kid. He literally was hustling, working weekend side jobs just to, you know, support our family. And eventually he bought a building grew the business, had, you know, eight service people working for him and then was servicing like eight counties in Michigan. I spent a lot of time as a kid working in the office doing invoices. So like, I, I think I learned a little bit about like unit economics, customer service, coordination, those kinds of things. And so that was some interesting experience that I think helped me from a young age, but it also instilled a little bit of a entrepreneurial identity. You know, you want to be like your dad, you see your dad do that and you're like, Someday, 
I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And I always thought that in my mind, I never knew what would work out and what wouldn't. So yeah, if I had to boil it down, it's probably a bit of the identity thing. And then just like a relentless pursuit of, of learning and growth that really got me here. The other angle that's probably relevant is like my health issues. So when I was in college, young age, you wouldn't have been able to tell even if you looked at me because I was more or less an athlete. I, you know, you look at me, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that guy's really healthy, really in shape. But I was having a lot of problems from the inside. I had ulcerative colitis. Um, oh, and I had this oh. issue where the doctors, yeah, it was, it was bad. Doctors were like, well, you're going to be in a colostomy bag at some point in your future. And you got to take this medication and we don't know what causes it. And you're going to have this for, for the rest of your life. Oh my God. Well, they didn't even ask me like, what are you eating? <laughs> and now I'm in college, right? You're like, you're right. Oh, yeah. I'm drinking beer on the weekends. I'm not sleeping very much. I'm stressed as hell. Fortunately with my upbringing, cause I grew up kind of in the country. Like I didn't grow up in a city. My parents, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. So we didn't like go out to eat. We just ate real food. So my natural instinct at the time was like, okay, I'm going to keep working out. I'm going to cut out all the beer, all the processed food, and I'm going to see what happens if I can wean off of this medication. And I just switched to real food and tried to manage my stress better. And pretty soon I was off the medication and the doctors were like, visibly, we can't tell any, any sign of ulcerative colitis. So that was a big aha moment in my life where I wanted to help other people figure that out because psoriasis, eczema, ulcerative colitis, all of these chronic autoimmune conditions where you're told, like, you just have it. Sorry. I mean, the amount of processed crap our parents brought us up on in America was insane. You know, everybody, you know, follows their own thing and, and kind of has their own health journey. But for me, when I started discovering, like, anthropology and learning about how humans evolved, then it all started clicking for me because for me, it's like, I don't at some level even need to know about the science of it because I just have to look at the habits of our, like what our bodies are made for and the environments that our bodies are made for. And I can make an easy decision. It's like eggs. It's a real food that people survived on sitting in front of a computer all day with artificial light. You're not moving, right? Our ancestors moved a lot. So it's, it's really easy to navigate once I had that aha moment. I kind of had that aha moment when I read Sapiens you know, the fruit tree and that totally reshaped my thinking of just like, what are we genetically or, you know, biologically programmed to over the past hundred thousand years versus like what we've been sprinted into in the past hundred and like trying to get a little bit back to some normalcy. I mean, other than it sounds like you grew up with a more hearty yeah. upbringing. <laughs> than I yeah, did. It was partly that when I had the first kind of aha moment, like, oh, I just need to eat real food. And so I would just choose things that were not processed, right? Outside of the grocery store, real fruit, real vegetables, real milk. I wouldn't get like the the skim. I wouldn't get the yogurt that had a bunch of crap in it. You know, I was just looking for whole milk and, and, and minimal amounts of things in it. And that's what changed it for me. What got me down the more or less the, the primal or ancestral route is I was digging into it a little bit deeper and wanted to kind of like understand the why behind it, behind like why those choices made sense for me. You know, I've done all kinds of things on the side of my career in the health realm. Like I helped Primal Kitchen in the early days. Uh, I started a, a health coaching practice where I, I would do that like nights and weekends and I would help people navigate their health. So I needed to be fully confident and armed with information so I could educate, you know, it's not, not good enough to not be able to tell people the reasoning behind it and why. And so that, that's what kind of like clicked for me, just doing that research and figuring that out. There's one other aspect that I think is pretty important is that when I was in the creative field, I was hanging around with a lot of creative folks and I, I noticed the business acumen was, was lacking and sometimes the people skills. And there's people in the creative world that just focus on the features, the type of camera, the type of lens. And they, they kind of miss the aspect of the storytelling piece. What are you trying to say? How are you trying to say it? How do you want people to feel when they watch this? Even walking a client through and setting expectations and making sure you hit budget. Like there's a business acumen piece of it that I think is missing in the creative world. So they shame it. 
yeah, they shame it and they look at it like it's a bad thing. And I read one book, man, early on in my career, I think it's To Sell is to Be Human by Daniel Pink. And he kind of breaks down the stigma around sales. And that was like another aha moment for me where I was like, well, this isn't a bad thing. Like in all of your relationships, in anything, if you want to get a raise at work, like there's a sales aspect to it. You know, when you get into things like persuasion and things like that, they're, they're, they're tools that you can use. And there's a parallel here with the content creation as well, because the angle that you shoot something in, the, when you put in the title, what the hook is like, camera movement, it, they're all tools to arrive at a certain destination. So I, I kind of like had that aha moment at that time. And I was like, oh man, I need to build my business acumen. I have to be able to work with people well. I have to be able to do the creative portion well. And if I can build skills in those areas, then I'm going to be a step above the competition and I'm going to get work and my career's going to go well. This is very wise advice for creatives, particularly in the era of AI. <laughs> AI will not replace you, but you need to be able to do more than just produce now, I think. Yeah, 100%. And that's a good point with AI too, because I, you know, digging that, like understanding who you're talking to and what their desires are, what action you want them to take. If, if you don't feed AI the right prompt and you can't answer those questions yourself, you're going to get something that's not effective. To get into how Heart and Soil started, I ran into uh, Dr. Paul, who's a, a health influencer, Dr. MD, and I was following him from the early days because I was in the ancestral health world and I pre-ordered his book early on. I listened to all his podcasts and by happenstance, I ended up in a sauna with him uh, in downtown Austin. And I was like, hey, I, I know you. Like I've read your book. So he was with two other guys, uh, Dylan and Doug. Doug is our ch chief uh, operating officer and, and Dylan's our research officer. Both incredible people, brilliant. And yeah, so I met him randomly, told him I knew he was going to launch a brand. And he's like, oh, I think we're good. You know, we got, we got stuff going on. I was like, all right, no problem, man. You know, I was just offering to help. Well, I, then I ran into him again organically in the sauna the next week. And they were about to launch the brand. And he's like, yeah, I, I think we could use a little bit of help. I went over on launch day and packed supplements. I was in FinTech at the time. And I literally was on a conference call with the marketing department, put it on mute and I'm packing supplements and just that initial wave of orders that came in on day one. And this is just the three of you initially. So it, it, Dr. Paul and... Uh, Doug Dillon, myself, Melanie, who was our, our social media uh, manager, was there at the time back in Southwest. She's actually the first person that I met when I, when I walked in there. She's wonderful too. And there were a couple people downstairs kind of like unloading boxes and, and stuff. So yeah, super, super small team and exciting too. It's like we had the opposite problem or challenge, I guess I'd call it in the beginning that, that some brands do and that People don't realize this because they're like, oh my gosh, you guys blew out of a cannon and like you have this incredible organic growth and all that's true. But if you rewind before launch day, Paul built a pretty substantial audience with a lot of trust and a lot of engagement for like four years. Dr. Paul. So we had Dr. to do something yeah. a couple of years that went into that as well. So <laughs> you yes. know, don't just turn around in the, that overnight success, right? <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's a whole backstory there where, you know, he, he worked his tail off and he had to put in all that sweat equity to get that audience there for that launch. Um, and that's missing from the story sometimes when, when people, uh, I think, look at it. If you're someone listening who wants to start a brand, the organic growth piece of it is so important. And I believe it's like, go test your idea in public, start building an audience. But if you're sitting and waiting for that perfect scenario where you're just going to launch it one day and you just have to rely on paid acquisition, it might not be as, as good of a scenario as you think it might be. When was this that you guys launched? Uh, right in the middle of the pandemic, July of 2020. No traffic. Yeah. Yeah. No traffic. It's great when you're running a warehouse and there's no one on the road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was a bit of a cultural moment there that I think helped helped us. I think folks were thinking about their health during that time. I think certain populations were wondering 
what can I do about this? Per, like, how can I protect myself against this? And so well, people started to question the health institutions as well and start looking for other expert advice other than the NHS. Exactly. Once they started lying to them. <laughs> and I remember Dr. Paul's account at the time was like one of the only places, his YouTube channel was incredible at the time because, but he was walking people through like what happens at the cellular level with the virus and stuff. And I, I remember just consuming his channel like crazy when the, when it just started because I couldn't, I couldn't find anywhere where there was like a, a credible person who's like scientifically like talking about it. So that was real cool. And I think that helped us, helped us a lot. But yeah, interesting timing to launch a brand right in the middle of pandemic. It was kind of eerie and weird. We're like this group of people in person, like doing all this work. And then you leave work and you're like, the whole world is like dead, right? You drive down the road, there's no cars. And you just left this like exciting day, you know, with, with a bunch of people. And it was great. It was, a. Uh, am happy. Personally, I'm happy that I was able to do that because Previous to that, I'm not a remote worker. I like being around people and I feel like it's Groundhog Day if I'm at home every day, kind of like doing the same routine. And so to get out of that helped me a lot personally. Tell me about the journey, how you came into the CEO role and who was who was CEO initially or was there one? Was it just kind of founder Paul leading or did you guys have another CEO? How did that come to be? So. Dr. Paul, obviously the influencer, the, the guy who made the wave happen for the brand, he was essentially in the CEO role when I came on. And there was a point around, so we launched in July, 2020. In January, he was taking a trip to Africa to go spend time with some indigenous people and, and learn a little bit about how, you know, how they navigated, how they ate, how they lived. At the same time, he was realizing man, I don't think I want to be CEO because he's very, he's very good at, he loves researching. He loves talking about nutrition. He loves, he, he's one of the best orators in the world when it comes to health and nutrition to his credit. And I, I know there's probably some founders listening, Corey, uh, you know, you've been a founder. It's tough to relinquish control. I imagine I've never started a business of this scale, like by myself, but I imagine when you have your monetary investment in it, your reputation is into it and everything else and your your identity to some level it's very hard to relinquish control and let somebody else kind of handle it and i give paul so much credit for this because he uh did a lot of soul searching and he's like you know what i'm meant to research i'm meant to spread this message and be on the front lines in that aspect and so he approached me around that time and and was like I want you to take over to build something great, to like you need other people. You need to be able, it, they have to be the right people, of course. You you have to, at some level, recognize where your zone of genius is and where it's not. And and places where you might not be as skilled or competent, you, you need to find the right people. That's one good lesson. The other good lesson from the story that I, I just love to share because it's unexpected is, I, I told you when I first was in the sauna, Doug, and Dylan, our COO and CRO were there. Well, Dylan was involved from way before, even when this thing was like an idea on paper, you know, helping out. Doug, way before me, um, working on the supply chain, you know, helping to get the business ready to go. When this happened, it's not hard to, to imagine a scenario in which these two other individuals who were involved in the business way before you better than you at certain things even wouldn't have a little resentment or be upset by that type of decision and i kid you not when this happened i was i had a little anxiety around it because i was like oh man how are they going to react like i don't want to screw up the dynamic here like i'm happy to play a lower part if i have to like i just want to win right this is the first opportunity in my life where my passion for health, where I can go all in, I'm not straddling two jobs. I'm not trying to start something on the side. I can just commit and just go full fledged forward. You know, I kid you not. They got announced in the room. Doug and Dylan were there. Dean's going to take over. Dylan jumps up out of his chair and goes, let's fucking go and high fives me. Doug was like, let's go. And that was it. It just speaks volumes to their character and 
also their alignment with what we're like, they want, they want to win. They want to get our products into people's hands. They want to help people with their health, provide hope, inspiration. And they really showed in that moment, there weren't any other alternative motives ever since that day. Like we've been, we're, we're like this and Doug has qualities and traits that he's very good at things that I'm not. Dylan's very good at things that I'm not and Doug. And so we've been kind of like a three headed team since day one. Yeah. It's just, it's just gone over so well. And part of me is like, I don't even know how this happened because I know that those types of dynamics are very difficult to navigate in business. So when you initially were in, you were in like a CMO type role, is that correct? Yeah. What was your marketing stack or was it really just limited retention because the, you have all the inbound interests? Did you have to learn performance marketing at all or were you just able to kind of get the selling working <laughs> like make it make sh stuff available to sell <laughs> really good question uh man i when i look back at it it's like phase one for us right in the beginning because we had such organic demand and then paul went on joe rogan at some point there too phase one for us was like tame the chaos and let's put some order to this well you also know this too in the beginning when there's only a few people the titles don't matter you know like cmo what like you're doing everything i'm in the trenches three C-level executives on the team, we answer customer emails for like over a year, you know, and sometimes like 80 a day, which I actually think is really valuable experience though. You know, if you're a founder, you're early stage right now, like get in there, talk to your customers, get to know them, get to know, you know, what the challenges are, what the roadblocks are, what they love, what they don't love. It's extremely useful. Do you still do that? Uh, from time to time, yes. Yep. And we have a community. So I pop in there every so often and I'll comment on some of the customer posts and, and whatnot. And just the other day, actually, my daughter, I just had my first child in April and it was her. Congratulations. Thank you. It was her one year birthday. And I went to our, uh, my wife's father's house and just random Saturday this is in Baytown, Texas, like, you know, not Austin, middle of nowhere. I guess one of the neighbors caught wind that somebody at this house was at Heart and Soil. They found out about me and wanted to meet me. This is a really weird experience. They're like, hey, can you go to the neighbor's house and talk to this person? And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's cool. So I walked over there and it was just a cool moment to like, I don't know, it felt fulfilling and great to see someone in the world that you never knew before that takes your products he, he's been taking our products since 2021. He had health conditions that he overcame like through the use of the products. He has two kids who, who take the products. And he he was like so grateful and thankful. And he's like, this changed my life, literally. Like I wasn't the same person before. And I still hasn't quite like sunk in with me, but it was just such a cool moment to see a real person in the real world who's benefited from the work that you're doing. It felt good. It felt real good. Colin, we got to get into something more meaningful. Like no one's, no one's lives are being changed with software. No one's thanking us. So it's a thankless job. I'll tell you what, <laughs> now being on the software side, no, no, that's, that's awesome. Now on the CEO side, I was curious, kind of the same question. Like what have you had to like, what skills have you had to develop? I mean, obviously interpersonal, but have you had to go deep on finance, operations, KPIs, board, investor management, all that, those things. I had no idea about anything, right? Like I worked at a fintech company and I knew about lifecycle marketing and I created content for ads. So like I had some understanding, but as far as like tool set goes, I had no idea. And I, I still have a piece of paper from like probably month two of the business where I wrote like the purchase journey. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool if we could email people like 30 days after they purchase? And I had all this stuff diagrammed out. You I designed wrote, Clavio. Yeah, yeah essentially. <laughs> and, and the whole team's like, oh yeah, we should do that. And keep in mind too, like Dylan, Doug, like none of us had e-commerce experience. It's None. amazing. You guys are adorable. And this is 2020. <laughs> yeah. I started in 2011 when there actually wasn't, we actually had to program those types of things like into our code because there was no Shopify, but continue. <laughs> yeah. I figured a tool out there had to be available, but you know, after I wrote it down, I'm like, this certainly has to be out there because 
know, I had done a lot of technical stuff in the past with like post-production and, you know, I knew about automations, triggers, flows, that, that kind of thing. But I started reaching out cold to people in e-com because I was like, I got to learn this from somebody. And I finally got in touch with somebody who's like, oh yeah, dude, just call Claudio, you know, send him an email. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was like, Bling. and he's like, yeah. And then when I looked at that software, I was like, hell yeah, this is going to work. <laughs> so, you know, put that into place. One advantage I think I had, like, even though I came into it cold, like I said, I, I was a post-production supervisor for a while. So I've managed a lot of data and automated flows of like approval processes and deliverables. And, and so like get into Clavio and setting up the flows was like easy. It's like, okay, I've done this before. No problem. But yeah, so in the beginning there, it was like a systems challenge, trying to learn just the tech ecosystem and what I could leverage and what I could connect. And the insight portion of it was difficult for me because even though I knew what like LTV was and I, I wasn't quite sure how to how to measure it or how to look at it. So I had all these questions try, and I was trying to absorb and learn as quickly as I could. It didn't make sense because I was like lifetime value, but they're still like their lifetime isn't done yet. And then yeah. these people have a different lifetime. How do I? No, it's it's pretty like, arbitrary that when it's yeah. non-subscription, um, but you guys are pretty heavily subscription, right? So yeah, it it's more, subscription and makes more sense. Yeah, it does. When you're selling jeans, it's very hard to say what the lifetime value. I'm, they're going to be with us for, we're saying 60 more years. No problem. <laughs> One purchase a year should be good. That's what is that? $20,000? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, the complexity of the business that, that you run in is, is insane to me. I just actually brought on a... Yeah, don't do it, kids. Jeans are the worst idea ever. It's the hardest product, like other than rockets to make. Well, that's why I brought on a VP of marketing news at Huckberry. If you're familiar with that brand. Yeah, of course. Uh, when I was talking to him, you know, just in the process before I hired him, he was just talking to me about how many campaigns they run, the complexity of like just the entire marketing ecosystem. And I was like, oh man, you're going to be great. We have like 13 SKUs. Like you're going <laughs> to be able to crush it, man. Well, yeah, no, I mean, one pair of one pair of jeans, you'll have like 14 or so waist sizes plus three inseams. So you're talking like 35 SKUs. And then you have three fits in that color. And then you might have 10 colors. So you're like, boom, a thousand SKUs, welcome. <laughs> so like big data, you know, and just like trying to do demand forecasting on that. And it's not like it's something you just like print out at the factory. Like you're cutting fabric and then you sew it, someone sews it, and then you wash it and you are predicting the shrink both horizontally and vertically on that fabric. Oh through my calculations God. and grading that at all 30 of those sizes. So it's, I mean, it's a disaster. You have the fabric, you have the thread, you have the pocketing, you have something called fusing that makes the waistband sit up. You have the button, you have the zipper, which frequently YKK zippers are hard to get. There'll be like shortages globally. And you just, oh, sorry, six more months till YKK is available. Unless you want to use this, the Swiss Riri zipper, which is the extra exclusive. I'm not sure I w would have done so well as CEO and a, and a merchant guy. I like hard things I've realized. So, you know, I got to start going easier on myself. Yeah. So in the beginning as CMO, there were a couple of things that were important to me. One was like, you know, I'm a big Seth Godin fan, Donald Miller on the marketing side. So one thing I knew is that one, we need to create a brand, right? There was a lot of pressure for me in the beginning to like just run Amazon PPC campaigns and like dig into the, into the paid stuff. And in my mind, I was like, well, why would I cut that margin out if there's enough demand on our direct channel? If we do that, then I'm not spending time on the storytelling piece and, and building like a deep connection with consumers with the brand. And so I wanted the brand to be the guide in the story, not the hero, because a lot of nutrition stuff like is talking down to you like, hey, stupid, just do this, right? And you know, the people that we're trying to serve, they're really the, the hero. You know, we want people to be able to live a truly radically healthy life and be able to play with their kids, you know, when they're, or their grandkids when they're 70 and, you know, still maybe shoot a basketball when they're older. And so that was one thing that was really important to me, just from like the brand voice standpoint, I, I wanted to just provide some inspiration and some hope, and hopefully that would lead them to want to be educated and then get into the product and then get into kind of the action piece of it. CX was important. We have thousands of people emailing us. Let's answer all their questions. Let's let's not just 
send this offshore. Let's hire some people in here who have a deep connection to this lifestyle and understand it and live it themselves. And let's try to build good relationships and go above and beyond for these people. That worked out really well. So then when I transitioned to CEO, it was still pretty early out. We still kind of were in that phase of like getting our tech stack figured out, getting our systems figured out, that kind of thing. But when I moved to CEO, then yeah, it was like, here's the, here's the keys to the car, right? And that's when I got a little taste of the, the finance portion of it. And I started thinking a little bit, try to move from reactivity to proactivity. That was really tough because I was still in the weeds on the marketing side. That was a long process. That probably took me a solid year to get out of the weeds, really. We had to make some hires and, and do that kind of thing. Another good lesson in there, though, is just being super involved in learning, building the systems yourself first before you pass it off. And that is like the core strategic asset is how you go to market beyond the product. You know, if you don't start out with a good foundation, it breaks really quickly. Um, and that goes down to like just as an editor, my, my rough edit, like I needed to build a good story foundation before I did the polish. And I thought the same thing with business. I'm like, the people operations need to be sound. The supply chain operations need to be sound. The finance operations need to be sound. And then we can start adding some some polish and testing new things. And so, yeah, I was pulling out of the weeds of marketing. Then I had to shift over to finance quite a bit at one point. We moved from cash accounting to accrual accounting. And so I had to get a whole master class trial by fire on that switch, which was fun. And the people operations were probably the biggest, you know, when, when you first start, you don't have like benefit plans and we made some really good hiring decisions, but I didn't have much of a process to scale it. So I'm like, between Doug Dill and I, we were doing all of the interviewing and all of the hiring. And eventually we reached a point where I'm like, I can't do all of this all of the time and neither can Doug or Dylan. We need a, a process and a way in which we can make sure we're spending the most time with the most qualified candidates and that we're hiring people who are effective in their jobs. So that was a big undertaking I took. Wrote an entire, it's almost a book. It's probably like a 20 page book on our on our hiring philosophy and process. And I built it all in Asana and Notion and onboarded into a applicant tracking system. I think you have a future in SaaS. Honestly. What? <laughs> Seriously. Um, you Do just it. did product design, buddy. <laughs> um, yes. You know, obviously in your content creation, you mentioned storytelling and that's a lot of what the role is. Now, I always have been told like the role of a good CEO is to hire, raise money and set strategy. And all of those are storytelling. Yes. To do good storytelling, you need two things. I think one, like good logic, because if you don't have good thinking logic and critical thinking, you're going to make a, con a story that doesn't make sense. Second, you need empathy. Again, two things that are basically what it takes to be a good CEO of a startup, uh, not a CEO of a stale company. Like to have vision, you need to have that empathy to be outward reaching, trying to serve customers, trying to think about what they need, what they want, and having an idea of how to get there. And, and so, I mean, I actually feel like more uh, filmmakers, you know, like if Netflix is bringing you down, we need more CEOs. The uh, There's going to be a lot of de-aggregation or well you make you make a really good point stories historically have moved the world and that's why i got into video production in the first place because i i like that it engaged in more senses than just one and so i don't know if i love marketing all that much i just like telling stories and i i, I like it when especially when you have something valuable you know, that you're willing to sell. I did a lot of freelance work in video where I'd have to sell something that I didn't really, I was like, okay. In, in general, working with people that you don't inspire you as a leader and you don't trust their ideas, that's what you brought to the table. That's why this, you know, uh, Doug and Dylan were like, hell yeah, let's go. It's because, you know, you have that humility, you have that thinking, you can, you know, the empathy necessarily to tell a good story. You're, you know, you were set up and bread yeah, for this. I think um, so. And to your point, like the storytelling piece, like being an effective CEO, storytelling is a big, big portion of it. And I, I try to reflect and look at, cause I made a ton of mistakes like early in my career. We've had, you know, certain challenges here sometimes where, you know, you're facing a little adversity as a team and, and people kind of get below the line of their thinking, or there might be like 
some side conversations and gossiping developing like that's a good example and for me like i think back to my career and i I made a huge mistake in that when i was first kind of promoted to a, a manager at texas state university when i was there i was that guy i was frustrated with some of how the bureaucracy was was working and i was pointing my finger at other people in the department i was talking with my team about you know how incompetent they are and can you believe this and two years into that i was the guy nobody wanted to go to lunch with and talk to because they they would be like well okay we're gonna go to lunch with dean and dean's gonna talk about the same shit that he's talked about for two years and it's miserable right it's miserable to be around people who are stewing in negativity like that's a real experience I had. So to be able to share that with a team and kind of put some concrete context around it, because that wasn't easy for me when I figured out this was actually all my fault. Like I am the one that pretty much set the bomb in this place. And that's why the department is fragmented. That's why people are upset. Like I was the one that drove a lot of that. But to be able to be honest about that and talk to your team about that, and use that as a learning lesson, it fires people up. Whereas like if, if you didn't have that experience or you're not telling a story around it, it doesn't connect as well. If you have a skill and a passion, there's probably a business where that's very strategic, like a part of its core strategy. And you might be well suited to be CEO of that business and all your frustration with inefficiency and bureaucracy and people who don't understand the skill set. Uh, like I think that's going to be shaken up in the you know, AI means we don't need worthless middle managers. So to execute, like you can create great memos and do all the things that, you know, a polished Harvard MBA can do. Like it's it's in the AI now and you can apply what actually matters, which is, you know, those strategic aspects, you know, for consumer products, certainly content storytelling brand is, is one of the, you know, product and brand are probably the two things, right? Uh, I mean, brand, including growth. How are you personally leveraging AI right now? Or are you like in your work? I kind of have a framework around this. I think there's condensing information. There's expanding information. There's analyzing information. There's iterating on content. There's wholly new created content. Um, and I'm probably missing one, but like th that's enough, right? Like you can do all those things. So like, Summarize, you can feed it now 128,000 tokens into these basic models, which is basically like the Harry Potter books one and two or something. I don't know. It's not quite that much, but it's a lot of content. And then be like, hey, tell me the action items that for Sarah. And so this can be your meeting transcripts. You know, this can be all these things in, you know, action, pushing it into summaries. Like I could think if I was still running a brand, like it, I wouldn't have my writer anymore. And like, so we spent a lot of money on writing you need to still know what's good writing like i knew what was good writing i just wasn't good as a writer myself you know a writer if i was like hey i like this but give me a hundred other options it'd be like i'm quitting ai is just like Whoop, there you go <laughs> you know so i think it's going to strip out a lot of unnecessary management i think it's going to make companies smaller there's gonna be a lot more small companies versus big companies it's gonna be more private public companies are going to start to fall apart if they don't fire 80 percent of their staff which i think it's gonna be bureaucratically very difficult for them to do right so that's my like high level but what do i know i'm just just a plebe you launched a new product this past week can you talk a little bit about that what the product is what was kind of like the launch the buzz around that how did you guys approach go to market is it absolutely crushing i'm sure the answer is yes but we'd love to hear it from you <laughs> yes absolutely crushing so the, the the product is a really special one, I think, in the in the journey of art and soil. When we first started the the company, you know, part of our philosophy is, is like understand where your food comes from, and generally, you know, the more locally sourced, the the better. So from day one, we wanted to build a supply chain in the U.S. to support American farmers. Right now, essentially, you know, most of the very nutritious organs they're going into dog food and other places and so yeah we we wanted to find a way to support american farmers and bring a product just 100 percent made in america we do 
all of our other sources right now are from New Zealand because they have extremely prestigious, like nice farms, regenerative raised. So yeah, we launched Pure American Liver. It's a full liver product, 100% source in the, in the US and we're super excited about it. Had a lot of buzz leading up to it. Support American uh, farmer vibe, which I really love. And we launched it on Wednesday, it's a couple of days in and uh, the whole team's excited. We've been taking it for about three weeks and it's wild. I've been taking organ supplements now for like probably five or six years. And this one, I feel it. Energy buzz, it, it's extremely, extremely good. Give me a protocol. I need, I'm 40 and, and health is declining. What do we do? I would do the stack I take. It's uh, pure American liver, which is uh, just liver. And then I, I add two to those. They're more conditional products. One is whole package. It has uh, natural occurring testosterone in it because it has bull testicle. And then the other one is mood, memory, and brain. So that's all those Rocky Mountain oysters out here in Colorado, by the way. Yes. Um, so I, I would do that stack. And the mood, memory, and brain's really cool. It has a compound in, in brain called, I'm not going to pronounce it right, but it's phosphocytylterine. But in, in studies, it, it shows that it helps with lowering anxiety and increasing focus. I kind of think of it like a natural, uh, natural form of Adderall. It, it, it'll make you a little clear in the head and allow you to focus. So yeah, get the, the male hormone support, whole package, move memory and brain and pure American liver. I'm on it. I'm placed in order. As soon as we hang up, I need all, all of these things. My <laughs> wife will thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Dean. So how are, how are you thinking about the future for heart and soil? Like, so you guys are at this really interesting level where paid media is kind of like you've topped out on paid media. You guys are so good. You've beaten the game, so to speak. What's the next level for you guys? I think it's good to start with a customer and how can we serve them better? What I see right now is that we've done a really good job educating. We've done a really good job, like providing, you know, these supplements and, and getting those in people's hands, but there's a whole behavior change component to like really achieving radical health. It's like, how do you, how do you build habits that, that stack? That's a little harder, right? The same thing happens in the financial realm, right? There's all this financial advice. Everyone knows I need to spend less than what I make. Everyone knows that, but no one does that. And the question is why is because we get in our own way and it's a psychological thing. And so I'm, I'm hoping to launch some non-physical products, maybe in a membership form, maybe in another type of form where I'm kind of in discovery right now, we're building out some self-paced health programs and different things so we can have like one-on-one -on -one guidance and get people armed with like the, the tools and things that they need to actually make change in their life. But I had this aha moment looking at Dave Ramsey and his funnel, and he, he does such a great job stair-stepping people and educating them and getting them to financial peace where they're not in debt anymore. And so I was kind of thinking about that parallel because I think most, most people know they shouldn't eat processed food or not move around. Like everybody knows they need to exercise and so it's like, why don't you do it? They're the same issues why people spend more than what they make. It's psychological. So I'm taking a, a, a page from Dave Ramsey's book and I'm, I want to put in some kind of infrastructure to give our customers the support and the guidance that they need to be able to achieve their health outcomes. I just ordered from Hardened Soil just now, by the way. Oh, this is unfair. I, I'm trying just, to pay Just drop the order. It's amazing. I think Paul is like a huge testament to that where you have this guy who is... I mean, I follow him personally on his YouTube like every day, and he is the testament to heart and soil in personified as a person where like you see his daily routine, you see he's surfing, you see he's skateboarding, and you're just like, oh, this guy lives and breathes this? Like, this is no BS. Yeah, he, he lives it, man. It's, uh, it's cool. That's another thing I like. I just like the people can smell bullshit, right? Like, if your company selling something and you don't actually use it or your team doesn't believe in it, like people can swallow it out. And so like everyone that is here at the company, like it's part of our hiring process, they live the lifestyle. And I think that's important. Everybody down to who manages the property, they, they all live the lifestyle. We kind of like connect over that and I think we can just understand our customer a little bit better and it's authentic at the end of the day. 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, Dean. Hope we can sauna sometime if you're ever in Boulder. Let's go. Oh man, I, I love Colorado. I do make it out there like once or twice. Uh, please, I'll, I'll shoot you a DM and let's get on text. And yeah, please let me know when you're out here. All right, I'm ready to go. I'll, I'll let yeah. you know when I'm in town next. Awesome. Sounds good, Dean.